Great. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk, present some work I did a couple of years ago, um, looking at different methods for generating ensembles to use in soil moisture data assimilation. Um, this work is covered in this paper. However, um, the paper is, it's a little bit more big picture. In the paper, I sort of focus on the fact that land model dynamics are different from atmospheric dy model dynamics. And these differences affect the way that errors grow and propagate in both systems. And so when we're doing data assimilation or designing an ensemble system, we need to think about these differences. Whereas today, the abstract call encouraged abstracts that address technical challenges in land DA. So I've sort of stepped back a bit from the more sort of big picture science aspects and I'm gonna sort of present instead more of the boring little details that I figured out while I did this work. However, if you are interested in the more big picture stuff, obviously I'll, I'll direct you to that paper. Okay, so the reason I was doing this work is that I'm in the process of implementing what at the moment is an LETKF uh, soil moisture analysis for our NWP system. Um, and the LETKF is applied directly to the ensemble of land states from our NWP uh, ensemble that we use in the atmospheric DA. So this is um, what I'm doing is essentially Shunji's weekly coupled uh, example. Um, one of the issues with doing this is that our ensembles are under dispersed at and near the land surface. Um, and this isn't really a surprise because these ensembles are generated for use in the atmospheric assimilation update. And so they don't currently include any mechanism to account for land model uncertainty when they generate that ensemble. Whereas if you think about what we do in offline land data assimilation, if when we generate our ensemble, we typically perturb the atmospheric forcing. And then that's not enough by itself. So we typically have some other second, uh, second method where we uh, add say perturbations to some of the land prognostics or parameters or something like that. And so it's this second, uh, aspect that's currently missing from our NWP ensembles. Um, and I've shown you an example of this under dispersed um, dispersal in NWP ensembles. This is from our, our system, but this occurs across all NWP centers. The top plots are for surface soil moisture. The bottom plots are for two meter temperature. All of the plots show forecast uncertainty or forecast error standard deviation. Plots on the left are my best estimate of what the forecast uncertainty is by comparison to independent observations. So for surface soil moisture, this is a triple co-location estimate. The plots on the right are then our ensemble spread. So you clearly see that we're, that we're underdoing it. So in order to um, implement my LETKF, I need to increase the spread in our ensemble system. Um, before I talk about how I've done that, I just wanna take a quick moment to have a look at the atmospheric spread that we have in our system, because this is sort of the other half of the, of, of the problem. So what I'm showing you here on the left is examples of uncertainty estimates um, that would be used in a typical offline land data assimilation system. I've based this on what's done in NASA's GMAO and list systems, just because that's what I'm familiar with. So what they do, which is pretty common, is take a single atmospheric realization, so a forecast or observations or some combination of, and then create an ensemble of atmospheric forcing by stochastically perturbing that single realization. And so I've shown new examples of this for precipitation on the top, long wave in the middle, and then short wave on the bottom. Um, for precipitation and short wave, these are frequently zero. So they, the perturbations are applied multiplicatively to avoid perturbing a zero state. Whereas for the long wave, it's additive. That's why the standard deviation is the same everywhere. Um, so the, and then the plots on the right are the ensemble standard deviation that I get from our NWP ensemble system. So the big thing that stands out is the spatial patterns are quite different. And in particular, so for example, if we look at the precipitation example, um, if you have a single realization and then you hit that with perturbations that are multiplicative, you can't account for uncertainty in the location of the, that precipitation event. Whereas when I've got my ensemble of different atmospheric realizations, you know, in each member, the precipitation event might be sort of timed or moved around slightly differently. And so that's why you see a much greater area of non-negligible spread. And so I'd argue that even in an offline system, it, if we can, it would be um, worthwhile using um, an ensemble of atmospheric realizations so that you can get this, you've, you've got the potential to have a more re realistic spatial error structure. The other advantage of course, is that you, you're more likely, you're going to have physical consistency between the different fields within that atmospheric member, which you might not get if you're adding stochastic perturbations to, to a single realization. Okay, so that's just sort of a bit of an aside. Now moving on to the, to the main topic here, which is I need a method to account for land model uncertainty in generating my ensembles. So what I did for this is I had a look at what's done in the land community, I had a look at what's done in the atmospheric community, and then I, I tested some different examples that I, that I thought might work. So I've run three experiments. The first I've called state PERT. 
In this experiment, I stochastically perturb the soil moisture and soil temperature at each time step. This is very commonly done in offline DA systems. The second one is SPPT, which is a common method used in the atmosphere. This doesn't actually work very well for soil moisture, and I'm not going to talk about it today in the interest of time, but if you're interested, reach out or, or have a look at the paper. And then the third I've called parameter perturbation. And so the idea here is to, to stochastically perturb key model parameters controlling the land atmosphere fluxes. I'm being very loose with the word parameter here. What I basically mean is any input in a into the model forecast that's not a prognostic. Um, and so this includes um, para true parameters, but also climatological fields like vegetation fraction, which is what I'm actually perturbing in this experiment. So I've tested all three of these approaches together with control with no land um, perturbations um, in a 30 day experiment using a simplified version of our cycling atmospheric DA, DA system. Um, I'm going to present the results in a series of plots that look like this. So this is basically, I took those maps that I showed you on the first site and instead of showing sort of millions of maps, I've condensed this information into a single plot. And so what I've done is for each grid cell in the map, I've um, looked at what the soil wetness index is um, and then just binned it by a soil wetness index. And now I'm plotting the mean across each of my soil wetness index bins. Um, I'm not here implying that soil witness index drives the forecast uncertainty. I'm just using it as a convenient um, measure of the, the local conditions. And so what you see, and then each of these plots in this case are for the forecast uncertainty for surface soil moisture. So the black line is my control. So that's just my ensemble run with no land perturbations. The red is my target. So that's my independent estimate. So in this case, it's triple co-location. And then I've got each of my experiments in the other colors. If we start with a state pert, that's that turquoisey colour, and there's two of those. I'll, I'll get to what the difference between those is soon. The big thing that stands out here is that it's creating far too much spread under dry conditions, and we've now got a skewed distribution that doesn't actually represent the spatial distribution that we had in or the spatial patterns that we had on the target estimate. And the reason for this is that um, the memory of the perturbations that we apply to the soil moisture depend on the on the soil moisture itself, which I'm showing you in this plot here. So basically for drier, drier conditions, a perturbation that we apply will persist for longer in the model. And so as I keep adding perturbations in, they just build up over time until we've got this skewed distribution that doesn't, yeah, that, that's, yeah. So what you're getting here is a distribution that, that represents the uh, local model memory rather than the local model uncertainty. So, um, I, yeah, so then um, I, I, I mentioned there were two experiments. So soil moisture is bounded above and below. And in the initial experiments, what I did is if a per perturbed soil state uh, exceeded one of those bounds, I just clipped it back to the boundary value, which is I think a pretty common approach. One of the issues with this is it results in a bias in the ensemble, particularly in dry areas. It occurs at the wet end as well, but it's much more pronounced in dry areas. And so what I did in the second experiment was I applied a flat top filter of soil wetness index to my perturbations. And the shape of the flat top filter is in that top right plot. So basically what it does is, is as you approach the boundaries, it just reduces the size of, of your perturbation. So you don't have that problem where you go over the boundaries. Um, and that's what that second experiment is. It's the solid one. So you see it helped a little bit with that skewed distribution, but didn't solve the problem. Um, so at this point, I'm sort of, I've sort of discarded that as an option because it's not really giving me a realistic representation of my understanding of the model uncertainty. The next is SPPT, I'm gonna skip that. And then moving on to the perturbed vegetation fraction, this is that dark blue line. You can see it's increased the spread. It's maintained that the, the shape of the distribution against SWE. Um, it is still under dispersed. However, you know, in theory, we could get more spread by adding a larger perturbation to vegetation fraction or a better approach would probably be to perturb a range of, of variables. However, the main reason that I actually, and the, perturbing the vegetation fraction is, is the method I've gone forward with, but the main reason for that is actually associated with the land atmosphere um, correlations within the ensemble. So the LETKF that I'm developing is, as a first step, I'm updating the soil moisture and soil temperature from two meter temperature and two meter specific humidity. So I'm very interested in what those cross component land atmosphere correlations look like between those two sets of variables. And so what I've got here is the correlation between soil moisture, two meter temperature on the left, soil moisture specific humidity on the right, during the night on the top, and then during the day on the bottom. Um, a few things stand out. If we start with the state pert experiment, which is that turquoisey color, what you can see here is that under dry conditions, it's increasing what the pre-existing correlations were. And this makes sense because under dry conditions, the latent heat flux is moisture limited and the 
and so soil moisture is, is one of the main drivers of, of, of the Bowen ratio. Whereas, and so if I add perturbations into that soil moisture, I'm basically just exaggerating that effect in the ensemble. On the other hand, the parameter perturbation experiment, I'm perturbing vegetation fraction, which I chose intentionally because it's pretty central to most of the land atmosphere flux calculations. And so by perturbing that, I'm effectively perturbing those, those flux calculations. And so it's basically exaggerating whatever the pre-existing correlations in the ensemble were. Um, and so you just see in each case, it's, it's the dark blue line, is that it's basically just sort of magnifying whatever the, the correlations were in the control run, which is the black line. Okay, next, if we look at the soil temperature correlation, so same plots, but this is for correlation with soil temperature rather than soil moisture. We see the, op and we look at the state pert, so that's the turquoise line. We see the opposite effect as what we had in the previous slide in that this has often actually weakened the pre-existing correlations, particularly in that bottom left plot, which is the temperature correlations, so soil temperature to humid temperature during the daytime. What's going on here is in this case, the atmosphere is actually driving the land atmosphere coupling or the radiation. And so by adding noise just to the, to the land component, I'm affected by, sorry, perturbing the land component, I'm just adding noise to the, to the correlation. And this, this sort of suggests a sort of a problem here with this approach in a coupled DA of perturbing one of your components. In, you know, for the, in the land atmosphere example, there are, there are times when the land drives the coupling and times when the atmosphere drives the coupling. And if I add perturbations to the prognostics in, in one of those components, it's going to increase my ensemble correlations when that component is driving the coupling and it's going to decrease them when the other component is driving the coupling. I haven't tested this in a data assimilation case, but I would have to believe that it, that it would be problematic and that, that, you, that the size of your increments would, would depend on, on, on what's driving the coupling. On the other hand, the parameter perturbation experiment, as before, it just enhances our pre-existing coupling. And I think it's, it's, I like this idea of having an ensemble that's representative of errors in the fluxes. Um, Okay, so then just for completion, um, this is the ensemble spread in the two minute temperature and specific humidity for each of my um, experiments. The main point here is that they're not adding nearly as much spread as I wanted them to, that you, there's a target estimate there in red, you can see everything is still very under dispersed. Um, yeah, then just moving on to the conclusions and recommendations. So now that atmospheric ensemble systems are more widespread, which they weren't when a lot of our offline land data assimilation systems were, were, were originally designed, I would recommend if possible using ensembles of atmospheric forecasts in those systems that I'm aware of in the US. I think DART is the only system that's doing that at the moment. Um, this gives you a more realistic spatial structure of your uncertainties, more physically consistent relationships between the different fields. Um, I would recommend perturbing model climatological fields or parameters in place of perturbing soil moisture states. Adding uniformly distributed perturbations to the soil moisture states gives ensemble spread represented the local soil moisture persistence rather than the expected forecast uncertainty. Um, whereas in my case with the NOAA land model, perturbing the vegetation fraction gave a spatial pattern in the, in the um, model spread that, that was quite reasonable. Um, however, the other and the other the main reason that I actually go with that in, in, in my coupled example is it is is that it's also creating ensembles that are representative errors in the land atmosphere across component fluxes. And so just to sort of generalize that, in a coupled DA example in general, I would recommend avoiding adding perturbations to states in one of the components and instead and instead try to apply methods that will perturb the intercomponent fluxes. Um, for bounded variables, I would look at considering using something like a flat top filter to reduce perturbations near the boundaries rather than clipping to the boundaries. Um, of course, this isn't going to be as, as good a solution as actually addressing the fact that we're, we're assimilating a bounded variable. You know, you could, you could the, a better solution long term would probably be to do something like go to Craig Bishop's gig filter or something like that. And then just sort of finally as next steps, when I did this work, I really just wanted to create enough ensemble spread that I can do my data assimilation experiments. Um, but I think the next step is actually to sit down and much more carefully think about the source of land model errors in our systems and then design a perturbation scheme that responds to that. And so I think the way to do this would be to perturb actual model parameters, you know, focusing on the sort of unobservable parameters that we typically get from lookup tables. Um, and then perhaps also scaling the magnitude of the applied perturbations according to local heterogeneity or some other measure of, of local model uncertainty. Okay, thank you.